since we can't get this experience in the US due to COVID, how do you think it will affect an IMG's application if they say that they don't have any clinical experience at all in the US? Any clinical experience in the US? Well, be, so again, they will be compared to their peers. And at this point, no one's having any um, any traditional in-person experience. So then they'll be compared to the peers who are doing telerotations, clinical experience. And so really you look at the rotate, you'll, you'll look at the application. It's like, well, this person's resourceful. They found a way to still continue their learning, their education, their exposure to uh, the, the U.S. system during a time where they were clearly not allowed in, but they still found a way to gather that information and gather that exposure and interact and interface with American docs. So that person is going to be looked upon more favorably than the person who just did not. So the opportunity is there. Um, but whether or not that person was in the hospital it does not matter. It does not matter. And, and honestly, we would be very suspicious of someone who's saying they were in a hospital of rotating during this time. Right. And so since you mentioned about telemedicine, we can, uh, I want to ask you how much value does a telemedicine rotation carry? The telemedicine rotation carries the same weight mm -hmm. uh, as an in-person rotation, if probably not a little more, just because the it is a more challenging um, interface to transition into. And so all of the schools, all of the, the uh, American schools have been focused on effectively training our medical students through a telerotation, telemedicine-based platform with the intention that post-COVID, this will very much still be an aspect, an important aspect of delivery of care and delivery of medical education. So, uh, so, so, so yes, it is, um, a tele, telerotation is, is going to look amazingly well um, uh, the the person with the telemedicine rotation is going to look very well resourced innovative and forward thinking in terms of their ability to access and utilize uh, platforms available to them in order to continue to uh, get their experience in their education and does an LOR provided for a telehealth rotation have the same importance as an LOR provided for getting hands-on experience at the hospital? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the telerotation LOR is an LOR. <laughs> uh, it is the same uh, LOR because what recruitment committees are looking for in your LOR is, of course, I, it, solid clinical skills, uh, commitment, dedication, good bedside manner, quality bedside manner, uh, being overall a very well-rounded physician with, with very solid clinical skills. And understanding that from a tele-rotation, a, a, a telemedicine-based interface, and the unique challenges that presents, that's going to elevate um, the perception of the candidate's skill set, right? Because you're going to you have to really rely on the senses that you have in order to assess uh, effectively the patients and the cases that are presented. So the telemedicine rotation LOR will definitely have equal if not slightly more weight uh, in terms of the LOR again for the for the uh, reason of resourcefulness and, and, and ingenuity. Okay that's really interesting to know and um, uh, 
is a letter of recommendation from a telemedicine rotation enough to say that I've got clinical experience while applying for a match? Yes. Yes. And, and again, so apparently it is. So definitely uh, with the, 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 the candidate, um, the soon to be PGY one in a couple of days uh, had not done any clinical experience in over five or, or so years. It, I think it was closer to 10 years. And her clinical experience was this cellar rotation. And that was all that she had from a, a clinical experience standpoint. So yes, it is absolutely. And understand from a recruitment committee standpoint, it is not like we are interviewing people who are graduating from college, right? So even though it, you're graduating from an international medical school, we still know you're still having medical training there. We don't think you're just, you know, learn the basic sciences and then you go to residency. No, there's still a clinical training aspect that comes, comes with it. And, and we are also aware very much that um, plenty of IMGs have very, very solid clinical skills as part of their training. And post-grad IMGs that I've inter interacted with, we talk all the time about, oh, how, you know, based on the countries that they come from, they're so busy seeing so many patients, in a, even in a training standpoint, that they don't get to do preventive preventative care. It's, I've got, you know, 30 patients and it's just me and my senior and that's it. And, you know, and so we are very much aware that IMGs as, 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 as trainees come with very, very solid clinical skills from a fundamental standpoint. Really, it's a lot of, it may be some, some you know, technological uh, access, when to order imaging studies that we may have a little bit more um, access to uh, stateside versus not, uh, preventative care, <laughs> um, that some of those are the areas where the adjustments have to happen or even just in terms of, you know, fewer or more end of life issues, you know, there, there may be um, conditions that we are more aggressive at, at treating and saving that may not necessarily be prioritized in, uh, in, in a more um, stressed uh, healthcare system. So those are typically the differences uh, that the, the IMGs have to adjust to. Um, it is definitely, it is, it is really not usually a physical exam clinical skill, clinical assessment standpoint. So, uh, so, so yes, a telerotation it would, is, is definitely enough to show that you've had some clinical U.S. experience. And um, are there IMG-friendly institutions that offer telemedicine rotations? Sue, that's a very good question. So right now, most of the institutions that train residents uh, train medical students or, or have a relationship with, um, with the medical school. And at this point, all of these institutions are prioritizing the medical students of the schools of which they, they come from, um, of which they have the relationship with. The telerotations that are being offered are pretty much in conjunction from that medical school uh, and, and, and the, the institution that, that they have the relationship with. But most of the bulk of the rotation aspect is being developed by the medical school. So when we think about it from the, the residency program side, that's, that's completely different. The, the priority of the residency program is to train its residents. So the residency program is not focused on developing a telerotation for students. So the telerotations that are institution-based and sponsored are from the, the, the medical students, the medical schools, for their students, uh, so but res but residency programs that are IMG friendly 
are definitely open, embracing, and welcoming of IMGs uh, participating in telerotations, uh, for sure. But but no, they would not be the ones that are sponsoring the rotations. Okay. And um, since you are a preceptor for a telemedicine rotation, there are a few questions regarding how the rotation would go about. Yes. So um, how many patients does a student get to see on a daily basis? So that certainly varies. Uh, so the, the delivery of the telerotation varies uh, between, not only between specialties, but even between, uh, between physicians. So there are some, um, there are some formats uh, that will, um, uh, where, where there are opportunities to do interviews with patients um, from a telemedicine platform. There are some formats that include uh, videos of patients um, that have been interviewed and or examined and walked through. Uh, and then there are uh, formats um, that also that that may just even include um, conversations over over the telephone. Every of care side, as physicians, we have to be prepared to deliver this care through whatever um, whatever device the patient has access to. So it definitely varies, and and this is this is one reason why this is so exciting uh, from a healthcare standpoint. In that uh, we really are fashioning our way of delivering care um, based on the patient, what, what the patients need and, and patients access. Right. And um, is there an opportunity to interact with patients or is it just a case discussion during your telemedicine session with students? So for, again, it varies based on the rotation. Uh, some, so some uh, uh, physicians who, are, who have patients that come in the office, there's definitely an opportunity for the, the rotator to interact. And then some physicians who are primarily hospital-based uh, where there really is not an opportunity to have a video system um, uh, appropriately HIPAA compliant um, there for for the students, then those may uh, just may be case uh, based discussions. Uh, but, and then the rest of the telerotation, of course, is still didactic lectures that are included, as well as quizzes and. And, and the same components of what a rotation would entail. Will an LOR obtained on a telemedicine rotation mention that it was done on, like, you know, it was done online and not at a hospital? So, so typically the, the content that would be in a telemedicine rotation is going to be the same content that you would get on an inpatient rotation. Now, there definitely is a need to mention that there was a telemedicine aspect to the rotation. And part of that is because, again, we know during this time that no IMGs and, and really no one other than third year medical students maybe are going to be in the hospital. So of course there really isn't an opportunity uh, to, I mean, it would, it would be dishonest to try and give the presumption as if the entire rotation did not have a telemedicine aspect to it. And that would also actually be at a disadvantage because, again, having a telemedicine rotation as part of the list of the litany of skill sets that you have to deliver care is certainly looked positively upon. LORs are important to speaking to the candidates character and ability and skill set. And those things can be gleaned through a number of interactions. Those are not limited to being gleaned through 
you took care of this patient with me. Um, we think about how important the dean's letter is. The dean's letter is very important. The dean likely has never had a patient with any of the, the candidates that they're writing the letter for. So, uh, so, so, so yes, the telerotation, so it is possible um, that, the, and it is likely that the telemedicine aspect of the rotation would be mentioned in the LOR. However, it will be mentioned as, again, this is a method in which you see this, this uh, candidate's bedside manner and ability and skill set shines through in a challenging uh, platform that, that is new to delivery of care. And um, what is the cost of a telemedicine rotation? It, there is some variation based on the length of time, right? So you are offered um, telemedicine rotation of varying lengths. But overall, from a, a dollar for a dollar, it is comparable to an in-person uh, rotation cost. Okay. Mm. Moving on to LORs. Uh, is a three-year-old LOR acceptable or does it have to be a recent one? Well, if, for example, if we took this out of um, out of the medical arena, and you, you know, if you were, I don't know, uh, interviewing or, or just assessing someone for a, a dog walker, for example, and you know, this person you 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 want them to walk your dog or even your babysitter, right? And you're like, well, can you give me a reference? And they'll say, sure, I'll give you this reference from three years ago. It's like, well, was that the last time you were babysitting? No, I've been babysitting for the last three years. I've been walking dogs for the last three years, yet you don't have a reference from any of the families that you have dog walked or babysat for in the last three years. That is not a person that is, um, would be highly considered because I want to know why. If this is something you've been doing for the last three years, why don't you have uh, someone recently who could speak for your skill set? So, so the same thing. Um, if, if you have letters from three years ago and you're applying now, it's, there's going to be a lot of questions that come up as to why that's the case. So, yes, you need at least one recent, at least one. I would say if you've been out three years or your LOR is three years ago, you really need to have probably all <laughs> recent LORs within the last year uh, for, for this application. Otherwise, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Right. That makes sense. And um, does an unwaived letter of recommendation carry any weight at all for an IMG? It's not really. It, it, it doesn't. So whenever we see an unwaived letter, that just means, you know, worst case scenario, the student wrote the letter and asked someone to sign it for them. <laughs> so, uh, so it doesn't. I mean, the, the, the whole concept of, of waiving a letter is, is basically, you know, it's, it's a trust factor and an honor code. And uh, we would, the, the assumption is that you have requested a letter from someone who could write you a strong letter of recommendation, and that's how it should be requested. And the person, the, the preceptor, the letter writer, should be confident and, um, uh, and, and honorable enough themselves to be, to be honest as to whether or not they can write you a strong letter of recommendation. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, so there, there's really no reason that a, a, a candidate should see their letter of recommendation. So no, you should not have an unwaived letter of recommendation. And with technology in the portal, there's really no reason to have the candidate need to see the letter. It can be uploaded. So yes, 